One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. Brewing a batch of beer is a fairly time-intensive task that involves numerous steps. Then, when you consider the fact we rely on a living organism, yeast, to turn the work that we create into the beer we hope turns out tasty, it makes sense that we might employ certain methods to reduce the risk of things going awry. For example, by ensuring the wort is well aerated. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And joining me on this episode to talk about oxygenation, particularly as it pertains to higher OG styles, is contributor Matt Del Fiaco. Yeah, I'm I'm love like I get to bring in my love of big beer every now and then <laughs> and I get to like make it a part of the conversation uh, because this what this use of air like just aerating your wart is I mean, obviously important um, for, for a number of like chemical reasons. And I think there's a lot of ways that home brewers introduce that now. And then also I think there's an argument to be made for like starters and what what starters provide yeah. in terms of. Yeah. And that's something I think we should it'd be cool to explore more. We've done a little bit of it, but just thinking about big beers and like bringing in these process adjustments where like, I really like when we talk about big beers, not just in terms of like the sugars that are provided or in the, uh, the, the rest, how the recipes change, but like how the process might need to change, like how your process might change to like be dictated by the beer you're brewing, which it kind of always should, but we don't really think of it that way. Like we move more and more towards streamlined processes that are the same kind of across the board Yeah. when, yeah, you have, you have a different, chemical composition you have a different wart and maybe it needs to be treated differently i think it's a cool thing to think about so i'm, I'm excited that we dove into this yeah yeah there, there are a few commonly discussed brewing methods that at one time i wrote off but then later kind of adopted uh you think about you know cold side oxidation stuff like that curiously oxygenation for me is just not one of them i've never owned an oxygen tank i've i've never had issues that i can tell of <laughs> or that have been related to a lack of oxygenation that said i don't really brew that many high og styles in fact i can count on one hand the number of beers I've made in the last decade that broke 1070, you know, right. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to chatting uh, about this, not not just oxygenation in general, but the impact uh, double dosing a high OG wort uh, with oxygen has. All right. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash Brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with someone in the brewing world. Coming up in February is Casey Helwig from the Imperial Yeast Crew. Obviously, we're huge fans of Imperial Yeast here at Brewlosophy, and based on the feedback we get from listeners, we are not the only ones who love their product. Imperial Yeast recently expanded to the East Coast and made some really great updates to the original Portland lab as well. So I'm sure we're going to be getting some info on that. These folks know their yeast as well as brewing in general. It's going to be an awesome session to be a part of it. Make sure to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by February. 26th, 2021. All past sessions with folks like John Kimmich from The Alchemist and author Scott Janish from Sapwood Cellars are stored on our private Facebook page, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review an Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really would appreciate it. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including a high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super fast shipping. Learn more at brewershardware.com. And do not forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. Listener Rob Roy had this to say after listening to episode 131, where we talked about using tinctures. As someone who homebrews but would love to open a brew pub, 
pub down the line, a thought popped into my head. You mentioned briefly that some professional brewers use tinctures and also mentioned they're typically made by steeping the spice in alcohol. My understanding is that adding alcohol to a brew is illegal on a professional level. So my question is, do pro brewers steep the spice in something other than alcohol or is there a specific threshold uh, to the specific amount of alcohol that can be added? I'm very curious as this would greatly influence my process down the line. Yeah, that's an incredible question and not one that I have a direct answer to. Like my, <laughs> You're not a lawyer? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's actually, that is what my answer is, which is that is something I would ask a lawyer. Like I would, I would absolutely like, and, and also you could probably ask like probrewer.com and like figure or any, any uh, professional brewer message board. Yeah. Um, like I know Reddit has the brewery uh, or are the brewery and stuff like that. Um, and you could definitely ask that question and it might vary by state. So always, of course, like get a legal get legal influence on that because you are at the point of becoming a brew pub. Like you're not just making, you're, you're making beer 2% of your job. Yeah. Uh, maybe not like time intensively, but you are running a business. That's so right. Don't worry about, worry about that. Don't worry about, uh, will this beer taste slightly different? Worry. I mean, of course, like carry your quality and your product, but you're, you're running a business, get legal feedback. Um, <laughs> there may be a threshold that makes sense. Um, obviously because like in, in there may be, uh, there may be like ways by which you need to like execute that process differently in theory. Um, or you might just end up skipping tinctures and you might just, so, uh, you might just soak things like in secondary or yeah. however you figure, you know, you might end up having to do it in a different way. So, but when you're at, when you're thinking here, you're like, Oh, w- am I going to do this differently when I'm a brewery? Everything you do now is going to be different. Yeah. Like you are, it is going to change everything. Absolutely. And I, I was thinking, uh, my, my good friend, Brad, who's brewing at Crow and Wolf here in Clovis, the, the newest cool, huge brewery that's going to be opening up here soon. And uh, I was over in the brewery the other day and he's got one of his uh, pie sours on. It sounds weird, but I'm telling you, this guy is an artist when it comes to making beer. Well, it has cinnamon in it and it has vanilla and I don't know if it has vanilla, but it has all these different flavorings. He's not using tinctures. He's adding the stuff directly. And I, I know quite a few commercial brewers and I think when they're adding flavorings to their beer, they're, they're mostly adding it directly, you know, towards the end of fermentation or uh, in their unit tanks or whatever. They're not using tinctures. Now, again, this is not a, a legal show. This is not legal advice, but my understanding is that laws regarding the presence of booze and beer more or less state that it just can't be discernible quantity. It can't be a discernible quantity. So for example, it's, it's pretty common to age certain styles in bourbon barrels and you can get away with doing that. You know that that's going to contribute at least a small amount of bourbon to the beer. And, and I don't believe that's an issue for most breweries. So I'd imagine the same is true uh, when you're using tinctures again, not legal advice. I wonder, uh, I wonder if though, like in that scenario, if you could like add a bottle of bourbon to that barrel yeah. and get away with that, like I do wonder where that line is because I guarantee I mean you're absolutely right there is one there's a line right um so I am curious but yeah that uh, uh I, my advice would be ask a lawyer uh if <laughs> yeah. when you when you go professional and then for now figure out what you like figure out what works for you um because it's not going to be a similar process if you scale yeah yep amen to that and again Rob it's a great question we're not pro- professional brewers we're not legal experts so that's just our best guess uh we do we do thank you for the feedback though if you have show feedback you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media You've heard his name a few times now, Mark Pellicle. This dude makes some very interesting fermented honey beverages and often sends samples uh, to me to share with my friends. One of these is something he calls Lagrimas dos Gringos, a capsamel made by marinating honey on peppers before fermenting it with a clean ale yeast and then dry hopping it with a little bit of galaxy. Uh, Mark said he came up with the name, which translates to Tears of the Gringos, because, and I quote, my gringo ass couldn't handle actually drinking this stuff. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Oh, dude, that smells like a hard Ooh. liquor. That smells like hard liquor. Bourbon-y, maybe? Yeah. Bourbon, whiskey bourbon? I'm not going to enjoy this. No, I, I can, can already tell, tell this is going to hurt. I'm hurting already, and I haven't even drank it. Why would I want to like something that hurts me? I know this is going to hurt me, Tim. <laughs> it smells like I'm going to clean a car part with it. Don't you? Someone put effort into this. I, let's, I, I appreciate that. Okay, let's drink it together. Run, two, three, go. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it's, got, ah, it's still burning. It's still burning. It's jalapeno <laughs> pepper. I'm going to puke. I'm gonna puke. <laughs> we took way too big of a oh, swing. Louise, I, didn't, I should have known not to do that. That Son was bad. God. Now I'm getting cigarette ashtray. What, have you ever drank a cigarette ashtray? The taste smells like an ashtray. I don't know what it is. It's spicy. Uh, it's like 
whiskey with jalapeno juice in it. Nailed it. I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a saison. Negative one. Yeah. Definitely not a saison. Definitely not a saison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. Yeah. No, it's not a saison. It sounds like the guys uh, are with Mark and not being able to stomach this Capsomel, and I am right there with them. Not a very good drink, in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of pepper-flavored beverages anyways, and and this one was pretty rough. I, I didn't get uh, the the heat or the... It didn't taste uh, solventy to me. That's what it sounded like Tim may have been describing. Mm. Uh, it didn't have a cleaner thing to me. It was just really odd and a, a bit too odd uh, for me to, to finish the entire sample, <laughs> unfortunately. But. Yeah, I think a Capsimel is not for everyone. Like it's it's a and I also think it's a pretty difficult style of me to do really, really well. Yeah. Um, but speaking like just I'm on I'm on Mark's side a bit where like I actually really, really love and I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, but uh, I like habanero cider a lot. Um, like just a little bit of a little bit of heat and a little bit of honey, like a little bit of sweetness is can go a long way. Like I think it's a really interesting drink. Um, but yeah, this it sounded sounded pretty intense. Uh, not something that they really should have dove into the way they did. It was brave uh, <laughs> after smelling it to be like, you know what we should do is shoot this, oh, which God. is a mistake. But yeah, it sounds it sounds like interesting, and I'm sure Mark's gonna do some other uh, cap smells in the future based on this. So I hope I hope Mark that you took some notes from this and refined that process because I do think cap smell done well uh, is delicious. Well, yeah, and kudos to Mark for for being so experimental in his mead making. I for think sure. it's a lot of fun. We we really do appreciate you sharing so much cool stuff with us, Mark. It's always a lot of fun trying them. Uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in reviewed by Jersey and Tim, you can email me Marshall at brewlosophy dot com, and we'll get you all set up. Time to give a little love to our sponsors. When we come back, our attention will turn to oxygenation when brewing high OG styles. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of work from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to GrainFather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to GrainFather.com, that's GrainFather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. When I think of yeast nutrient, my mind immediately goes to the powdery stuff brewers add to wort in the last five to 10 minutes of the boil. However, one of the most important nutrients for yeast is oxygen for various reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Again, like it's it's something I don't think that's overlooked, but it is also something like you mentioned a little bit early, Marshall. Earlier, Marshall is like not a lot of brewers um, 
I mean, a lot of brewers will, but it's one of those things. I think it comes up like later on in the process. Like most people start off shaking their carboys and it's like, oh, you probably don't need Puro 2 until later. And like all those things. Right. <laughs> yeah. But when we think about it, I mean, as, as a quick forward, actually, I just want to say that I think I've mentioned this before, uh, cause this is, I think our, actually you are my second discussion talking about oxygen. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But thinking about this, like White and Zanishev have the book Yeast. They have really great material in there on just like what oxygen does. Uh, of course, so does uh, Fix on Principles of Brewing Science. Of course, so does Barth in uh, Chemistry of Beer. So if you're if you're interested in the chemical side, like in-depth stuff, uh, those are three great resources. But as a, at a high level, oxygen is necessary for cell wall maintenance right. and production. So as yeast uh, goes through everything, especially in high gravity warts, uh, it, it needs to maintain its cell wall to deal with like the osmotic pressure to make sure that it's you know healthy and not being uh, compromised. And then of course, uh, the, it does this like, you know, it, it's critical in the synthesis of sterols. So really, helping that membrane permeability it's it's critical like it's how yeast reproduce effectively and it's how yeast handle the pressures of their environment yeah yeah that's the that's the the piece that i think is the most important when when talking about oxygen uh and i and I, i've said this disclaimer before uh there is absolutely no denying that yeast need oxygen uh in order to oh, yeah. do what we want them to do they have to be well oxygenated uh and the, they have an aerobic phase which is the kind of the point right well, yeah explain a little bit go go into detail a little bit about this aerobic phase i think the whole anaerobic and aerobic stuff when it comes to fermentation can be kind of confusing uh for some folks i know for me as uh, somebody who's not a, a microbiologist uh <laughs> the, the 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 aerobic phase is a very important aspect of the of the life cycle or the fermentation cycle right of yeast yeah yeah exactly so again and so yeast have like during this whole fermentation process, uh, which I think actually fermentation might technically be only the anaerobic phase. Um, I think so. Yeah. So it's, it's aerobic and anaerobic, uh, phases. And really they have like this respiration phase where, uh, oxygen is needed pretty much in any sort of carbon to carbon compound construction. Um, and so like you have, or at least, at least as far as we're talking about. And so, the yeast need to go through this respiration phase and through like this, they need this oxygen in order to create the sterols and the lipids that are going to, again, play that key role in membrane permeability and cell wall maintenance. Um, and it's once they go into like their anaerobic phase that we start the production of alcohol, right, um, right. which I think happens like at a little bit of different scales, but yeah, we, we then start the production of alcohol, which we start yeast will really quickly consume uh, oxygen. It's, I think fix usually says like within a couple of hours. Right. Um, and that is like, that's just, there's some things in there like on pitch rate and stuff like that, like just on how you impact it. But yeah, it, it happens really, really quickly. And so once those reserves are done and we move into this anaerobic phase, uh, it hinders the production of some of those compounds, which again, like are needed for cell wall maintenance. So if you don't have enough, uh, there's this actually, as I was doing a little bit more research for this episode, there is a really, really good, uh, paper. I was uh, a paper I found and let me see if I can grab that. Basically, uh, there's this great paper that it's about, it goes through the, I think it's called the effects of osmotic pressure on ethanol and on, and ethanol on yeast viability and morphology. Uh, it's by Pratt, Bryce, and Stewart. And there's actually some really cool pictures in there uh, showing you, like, this is what yeast looks like in intense osmotic pressure environments. Hmm. Uh, and it shows you, like, this is what happens when yeast don't have the compounds to do damage. And, like, they look they look jacked up. Like they, And that's what it is. <laughs> like, just during that pressure, if they can't maintain the cell wall effectively. So, yeah, it's, it's a really, really critical first part of that phase is the ability to support those membranes. So a part of a part of uh, one of the terms, I suppose, that, that, that gets thrown around when we're talking about uh, wort aeration in general, but then particularly as it as it, uh, you know, uh, pertains to oxygen is this term mm -hmm. dissolved oxygen. Um, I feel like that term has been more used in the past five years than it was. But that could just be that I'm, I'm you know, every day I dig myself deeper and deeper into this trench we call homebrewing. Um, yeah. is there anything particular about dissolved oxygen that you think our listeners should know? Is there, is there anything different about it than just, is it just the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the word? Is, is, is it as simple as that? Yeah, it's, it's just dissolved oxygen, meaning, um, it's really, it's just a measure for the concentration of oxygen that's dissolved in a solution, right? So when we talk about dissolved oxygen, 
uh, talks about dissolved oxygen. It is the amount of oxygen dissolved in said solution, usually uh, measured in PPM parts per million. Right. Um, and that is as far as like uh, home brewing goes, and as far as beer goes, typically the rule we see is within like eight to ten PPM for an average beer. Uh, eight to ten PPM dissolved oxygen is considered to be like the good amount to ensure yeast health through a quote unquote normal fermentation. Right, right. And, and I and I feel like the importance of DO or dissolved oxygen is often just gets ter- paired down to its, uh, you know, th- those two letters. Yes. Um, yeah. The importance of it is, is that it's you can you'll talk to people who say I hit my wort with this um, this number of minutes of oxygen. That is not a measure of how much oxygen is right. actually in the wort. And I feel right. like I feel I mean it sounds petty, but I feel like that's an important uh, thing to distinguish is that dissolved oxygen is the actual amount, and it's you're not going to be measuring dissolved oxygen on the homebrew scale. I mean you've uh, Crone you Wolf just picked you up. To. You can if you want to. It's going to cost yeah, you, you about can fifteen get an grand. Probe. Yeah, <laughs> these these dissolved oxygen meters uh, from from folks like Anton par are just massively amazing and expensive so uh it's not a, it's not an easy thing for home, the typical home brewer to be able to to, to measure uh but dissol- dissolved oxygen it just if you hear us say do or dissolved oxygen we're talking about the actual amount of oxygen present in uh right. the wort or the beer right uh so okay so i think i think what we should do now there are various different ways to oxygenate or aerate uh, uh your wort the, you started off talking about shaking i mean i think that's probably yeah. the most common way now, uh, Y yeast did a really cool series of experiments where they tested the amount of dissolved oxygen using these various different methods. And I thought maybe we could break down real quick what they found in, in terms of the PPM, the actual amount, again, of DO that was in the wort. I, I spent a long time uh, just racking my wort through a $3 siphon spray aerator uh you put it on Mm. the end of a piece of tube and then you you know connect that to your valve on your kettle and then when you open up that valve it goes through this it goes through your tube and then it hits this aerator and it just spreads the wort out Uh, and to me you know i thought it's it takes less work than shaking the damn thing so yeah and it's i mean you're dramatically increasing that surface area right that's going to be exposed and like obviously yeah so that that makes sense especially i mean if that is going to be your your method like if you want to do a vigorous transfer uh as as a way or you know like shaking or just like transferring it really hard which i've tried before right uh that those those work they're cheap they make sense if that's yeah. going to be the path you go down it, they, like i said they it cost me three bucks at more beer yeah, <laughs> so exactly. it was a lot cheaper than a whole oxygen setup uh, i don't use it anymore but i did what y yeast found is that that can add r- right about four ppm of oxygen to your work so you're still about half of what the recommended uh dosage should be that you know at that eight to ten ppm range um yeah. but but four ppm is better than nothing uh, they also tested aeration through shaking or just transferring vigorously without a wort aeration siphon spray and interestingly uh, this apparent this method can contribute up to 8 ppm of oxygen uh, if you just shake vigorously shake your uh, fermenter you want to make sure it's closed unless you like cleaning up messes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm a little skeptical of that only only because um I know in yeast, uh, White and Zanishev actually referenced a study that White Labs did, and they said that after like five minutes of shaking, they only got 2.7 ppm. Oh, geez. Oxygen, That's a huge difference. Which is, which is, yeah, it's dramatically different in both in uh, the measured ppm of oxygen as well as like the time involved. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical. Like, I, I wonder how much that really is. Like, it'd be cool if someone, like, if I don't know, I think, uh, Jake might have a DO meter or like, I mean, I know we have friends who have a DO meter or we could get like a, a probe if we ever wanted to and really like just see what it was shaking it. Cause I'm not sure. Maybe it depends on the vessel. Maybe it depends on how it's done. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, either way, the good, a good point is like you like one. And I think this is going to come up that, uh, in, from the air around 8 PPM is going to be the max you'll get. Right. Right. Um, you know, like when we talk about that eight to 10, roughly just like from, from the oxygen present in the air we breathe, like you'll usually get somewhere in the 8 PPM range at most. Um, and then even in both of these studies, the ones white, uh, white labs did and the one Y's did, uh, it sounds like, I mean, honestly, 
I wonder how much of a dramatic difference there is between 4 ppm and 8 ppm. Yeah. Uh, probably, I mean, probably something for sure. There's a reason that 8 is sort of that low boundary that you want to target. Right. But yeah, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of those numbers. <laughs> well, and I was wondering as well, uh, I, I, it's, I'm sure they reference it in the paper, but I don't recall. Like, what is the... To what extent is OG, for example, or, or general work composition, is that a function of, or, or is the amount of DO that you can actually get into that, that style of work a function of the, of the OG or some other work yeah, characteristic? Yeah. So uh, again, this is, this is one study I think is interesting. They also tested a, an aquarium pump. Now, these, these used to be way more popular than they are today, and I think for good reason. Uh, these are just little small pumps that you, that, you know, a little, the one I used had like a little HEPA filter in line. Uh, yeah. And so it would pump air, for, you know, regular old air into your wort. You'd leave it there for five, 10 minutes, whatever it was. Uh, and, and, you know, again, slowly that, that filtered air would just kind of go into the wort. And what they found is that after five minutes of running an aquarium pump like this, uh, they got 8 ppm, right about 8 ppm of oxygen, uh, of DO into the wort. Um, and, and which, because of the fact that that, that matched some of the easier ways uh, of aerating like work. shaking, you mean? Yeah, yeah, it matches yeah. the shaking. It matches uh, the, yeah, just being vigorous with your with your wort in the uh, fermenter. They they kind of wrote off using aquarium pumps. This said that it wasn't an efficient method, uh, which is probably, I, I have a feeling that's part of the reason you just don't see that those things being sold much anymore. They used to be pretty popular, though. Yeah, maybe. I, I do think like definitely if you could set it and forget it for five minutes and be somewhat confident that you're reaching 8 ppm, I guess that makes sense, though. Obviously, you're you're going to replace that filter for sure, which is something I don't think I know a lot of home brewers who I don't think they've ever replaced the filter in line of their <laughs> oxygen meter no, uh, or their, their oxygen system. And they probably should. Yeah. But and yeah, I mean, with a diffusion stone, like you can be fairly confident that you're you're extracting that and putting it into the wart. So I get it. Like, I, I understand how this could be appealing for sure. It's also like you don't have to keep replacing the tank, right? Because when we, the other way in which like people go about this, uh, in which is I think the most common one that I see from people who are like, who care a lot about uh, the, how much they're putting, how much they're aerating their wart right. uh, is, you know, using the pure oxygen tank, which I know you didn't do, but it's, it's actually similar to the pump where, you get a pure oxygen tank uh, from, you can get it somewhere like Home Depot. Um, and then you have a diffusion stone. Uh, and I know actually some people use medical grade oxygen, which I yeah. think is interesting. I think it has to do with packaging practices primarily. But either way, um, the you, you also use a filter and a diffusion stone and just crank that. And that, because it's obviously pure oxygen with the diffusion stone, uh, it does cost you a bit more because you're getting a regulator. You've got to replace those oxygen tanks. Yeah. But you can also add up like in, in about a minute can add around 12 ppm <laughs> to your beers. Which is quite a bit more than any of these other methods. I mean, that, yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's more. Yeah. For and, sure. and that's the thing is if, if, if there's, it, this is how I think of things. Okay. So this is the, the brain of Marshall. If oxygen actually does matter, then clearly, uh, well, oxygenation, we should say, we know oxygen matters, but getting these higher levels, then, then it would, it would appear based on the studies out there that, that using pure oxygen is by far the most efficient, uh, best way to get DO into your wort. Um, I, yeah. I was going to say, I, I've used the aquarium pump. I was, uh, what was it? Gosh, eight years ago, nine years ago. Now I, I was trying to just kind of hone my process and make the best beer I possibly could. But I don't know why I didn't buy an oxygen setup. Uh, they're not that expensive, but I didn't. And no. I bought the aquarium pump. And after using it like four or five times, I just could not, on an anecdotal level, could not see any benefit. I was still getting the same attenuation, you know, same fermentation, uh, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. My beers didn't taste any different as far as I could tell. So I just kind of wrapped that thing up and threw it in the bottom of one of my, my, my workbench. <laughs> just kind of, it's still there. I, I guarantee you it's still out there with yeah, dust totally. all over it. Uh, so I, I didn't use that. I, I just went back to kind of vigorously transferring uh, wort into the kettle. Uh, so oxygen tanks clearly, again, based on this Y yeast test, and I'm sure that they mention it in yeast as well, oxygen is the best way to get oxygen in your beer. Imagine that, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the pros and the cons. Like, what can, what might we expect from a fermentation that that it happens where yeast didn't have enough oxygen? They they were uh, that the, the absence of DO in the wort. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you mentioned earlier, actually, it depends a little bit on the wort itself, like how severe those impacts would be. But 
in general, we would expect that yeast to be under a lot more stress um, because wort is a stressful environment by its nature. Uh, you know, obviously osmotic pressure uh, at bigger scales, hydrostatic pressure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, alcohol is literally like a poison. Uh, it's toxic, so that's not good. But yeah, so it's it's generally like as the yeast are less resilient, as they are able to less uh, adeptly perform uh, like uh, cell wall constr- uh, cell wall maintenance, then you would start to see more cell death. You'd see less yeast viability. You'd see higher final gravities in theory. Yeah, um, yeah. You would start to maybe get some off flavors from the yeast, uh, just like through the production of it because of the stress. Yeah. So yeah, you'd, you'd start to see, in theory, you'd see quite a few problems that would only get worse as that gravity goes up. And that's that's the key is that it, the, the gravity of, of the wort, you know, your OG is going to, obviously put more stress on the yeast you're giving them more work basically yes um and and so when i you know when i was studying uh, uh oxygenation methods and, and stuff years ago in trying to decide what method to use um a lot of the a lot of the consequences of failing to properly oxygenate your wort were you know like you said a, a less attenuation like not reaching the fg that you expect uh, right. based on the recipe that you designed and that sucks i mean I, that that is to me one of the more annoying issues in brewing thankfully it's it's never really happened to me which is a part of the reason i still don't own an oxygen cell. right uh but other things like you mentioned um th- there are various off flavors that can be related to ultimately can be traced back to a lack of oxygen uh, it'd be hard to determine if that's exactly what caused an issue yeah exactly but, but things like for example increased esters or phenols uh, in a beer could be because those yeast were so stressed and they wouldn't have been stressed if they'd been able to build up those cell walls properly because of, of oxygen. And another one is, and I feel like we don't taste this very often these days, but autolysis, that those yeast are exploding mm, yeah. and releasing their innards into your beer. And you can taste that. To me, it's like burnt rubber. Uh, yeah. I, I've, it's, I've inten- it's a really unpleasant flavor. It's gross. It's, I, I, I intentionally really made a beer with very old... A uh, low cell count, no oxygen, um, just to see if I could produce autolysis. It's not impossible. Uh, you can do it, and it is. It is not a very pleasant uh, uh, characteristic at all. Yeah, I forgot a meat in primary for like a year and a half, um, and it was just very gross by Ugh. the end of it. It was really, it was really, really unpleasant. Yeah, um, which is weird because like I actually there are some. Uh, there's a really famous. Uh, I forget the guy's last name. I think his name's Dan. Uh, if you know the book, um, if you know. Uh, the the book i think it's like modern mead maker or something along those lines there's a really famous riesling uh riesling uh piment recipe like uh, so piment is uh basically like wine it's 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 a honey wine obviously because it's mead but it's it's like a wine base like a grape must <laughs> um and with honey and so that one actually does like last in primary i think for a year uh which is like the recommendation is supposed to be very, very good. So the, I'm sure the conditions and like the health of the yeast play a big role in like how I'll title it, uh, how that gets expressed. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's real unpleasant when it happens. <laughs> I hate it. It's one of the worst. Uh, thankfully, yeah. again, we don't. We, we've got such healthy yeast nowadays, and that's the thing. Is a lot of times the yeast that we're getting. I've I, again, I've only used Imperial for the last few years. I'm telling you that they're, they're they're sending you such healthy yeast that's ready to go. That a lot of times oxygenation is more of a risk reduction thing, in my opinion. Now, when you're brewing mm. these high OG styles, which Matt, you're the expert on that. I I don't do it very often. I know you really enjoy bigger beers. That I do. It becomes more and more important. To to nurture those yeasts and to make sure that that they are ready to ferment that wort because you want to, the, the bigger that beer gets, you got to do what you can to ensure that they do the right thing, that they do what you're expecting them to do. What types of pressures are put on yeast in a higher OG? And we're talking, you know, we're talking 1100 OG, 1.100 and higher. The the pressures on, on the yeast are, are quite, they're various, right? I mean, it's more than just the fact that it's high OG. Yeah. I think the two big ones um, we I briefly mentioned. So the first being osmotic pressure, uh, which is it basically just means like when you have two different solutes in one solution, um, if they have like different concentrations, they're going to put the the one with a higher concentration is going to put pressure on the one with the lesser concentration. Right. Uh, so for wort, that just means you know the concentration of the wort itself, and then what is inside of the yeast cell. So like what's separated by the cell wall. Right. 
Um, and I actually, I mentioned that paper earlier, the effects of osmotic pressure and ethanol on yeast viability and morphology. If you want to see some really cool pictures of yeast cells that have like gone under that pressure, I highly recommend it. It's really, it's the nerdy, it's a nerdy thing for you to do, but it's super <laughs> cool. Um, but that's right. So as that osmotic pressure goes up, uh, and you know, the, the outside of that cell, the, the wart is higher and higher density, um, it's just really, really stressful on the yeast, especially, and that's really critical in the early phases where, it, in, so another thing that oxygen influences is, of course, um, fermentation time, right? Like the, the amount of time in theory to kick off uh, and then the amount of time like until you reach a terminal gravity. Right, right, right. And so especially early where like you're not reproducing fast enough and that mm -hmm. cell wall maintenance isn't being done properly and fermentation isn't really kicking off. That yeast is just in a harsher environment for a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, and it ends up really damaging the yeast. It causes a lot of problems. Uh, and then, of course, the second problem is alcohol, which, again, is toxic. And so because you're brewing this higher gravity wort, you are brewing a beer that is going to have higher concentrations of alcohol in it, which is going to impact like the yeast cell cycle times. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just going to start causing stress responses. So even the problem is also like you're, you're kind of screwed on both ends. Like you're in the beginning, really high density and pressure. And then in the end, higher alcohol. And so having that oxygen introduced is a way to ensure that that fermentation is going to be healthy early and that the yeast are going to be able to build up the cell walls to handle a toxic environment yeah. as it moves later on. Yeah. I, I like the, I like the term toxic environment because that's exactly what it is. And it is. Yeah. It's hostile. It's very hostile. And the, and the way that I think about it, and this is probably stupid, but it, again, I dumb things down. So I, I, you know, understand things myself is I could go outside right now and run two, maybe three miles and not even really feel it tomorrow. You know, I, that's pretty normal for me to that's run a, a couple of miles. Humble brag there, Marshall. That, I, I, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it is actually, <laughs> I know a lot of people who run far more than that, but if I tried to run a marathon, there's no way I'd be able to make it because I've got no sure. training. I'm not prepped. I don't have my cell walls aren't built up to put it, <laughs> to put mm -hmm. it, a, a, you know, relative to what we're talking about here. So that's, that to me is the way I think about oxygen is you are doing everything Thing you can to prepare those yeast to work their tails off in in a in, in a what is a hostile you know uh, toxic yep. environment. Now there are a few different ways brewers using pure oxygen uh, uh, can can kind of coax their beer into doing what they want it to do through the use of oxygen. And one that I thought was interesting that I'd never heard of, uh, but but it's something that you had been playing around with is double dosing the beer with oxygen. Yeah. So you hit it first, uh, you know, prior to pitching your yeast or, or immediately after. I know some people who do that, but then you come back later and you hit it again with oxygen. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So this is, uh, it's something that they talk a little bit about in yeast. Uh, and then it's, you know, there's, uh, some professional breweries that brew traditionally big beers who have talked about this a little bit, but really, uh, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. So you first, like you said, Marshall hit it. Um, and then if we, if fix is to be believed, which in a many scenarios he is, yeah. um, the uh, he has this weird self-referential thing sometimes, but I do like fix a lot. <laughs> um, but anyway, so but when uh, when you are the yeast consumes that oxygen really, really quickly, typically within a few hours, of course, depending on a couple different factors. Um, but once it consumes all of that oxygen, it starts going into that anaerobic phase. And like we said, like these are really hostile environments. It's toxic. And so by introducing a second dose of oxygen after the first division uh, cell division right so after we are confident that all of that yeast has been consumed already that they are start the yeast are starting to they've been reproducing uh, a second dose of oxygen will actually pull the yeast back into like that respiration phase hmm. and it's going to make that increasing yeast count more resilient over time so in the idea being that you are going to then Give, put them in a position not to peter out, basically, right, that they right, don't, right. by the end of this, leave you with a several points higher final gravity or leave you with off flavors from just like this stress. And, and also like a slower fermentation yeah. where how long do you want that beer sitting with that yeast is is another. And for, you know, I think fermentation speed infections aside, like I think that's yeah. something pr I know like pro brewers of course are very concerned about i don't care if i leave the beer in primary for an extra week yeah i do care if uh there's more time for an infection to set in if there is one out there yeah so there, that of course like i get it i make sense but 
Yeah. So that's it, right? Like it's, it's, you're preparing this and you're giving it the second dose so that it can again, now with more yeast, build up those results, uh, build, like, you know, get through the lipids and sterols to make the yeast healthier. I would imagine that the one of the easiest to observe, again, I'm just presuming here because I've never done this, but one of the, the the consequences that you would see pretty readily is that better attenuation uh, is, yep. is would be an argument because what you're doing is providing more for that yeast to, to keep going. You know, it's the, I did run a half marathon once there. If that's a humble brag, I promise I'll never do it again. It was hell. Absolutely miserable. But uh, like every mile or so there's these tables and they have like this, this caffeine gel that you can shoot. <laughs> it's so gross, but it, it helps, you know, by the end of the, by the end of the run, I was shaken. That's sort of how I view this double dosing with oxygen is you're going in there and giving them a little boost. All right, keep on going, guys, you know. And so that's that's kind of what it is. Well, as a lover of big beers, Matt, you were curious what impact double dosing with oxygen would have, and you put it to the test. Results from that experiment when we're back from this break. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Accelerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at craftmastergrowlers.com. The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at checkout out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Of all of the Brewlosophy team members, Matt, you're the one I think of when it comes to big beers like Imperial Stout and Barley Wine. In fact, when we first met, that was one of your main focuses, if I recall. Oh, yeah. And you've tended to rely on using pure oxygen as a matter of course when brewing these styles. Curious if double dosing such a beer with oxygen would have a noticeable impact. You put it to the test. Yeah, absolutely. So for this, I wanted to do a beer I was really familiar with. So I went with my uh, kind of my house imperial stout recipe um which is loosely inspired by uh oscar blues 1050 um and which is one of my favorites uh and a little bit of trial and error of some of the recipe but uh the only thing i had to do like that compromised it a little bit was i ended up using five percent table sugar so and this is a, that was primarily a restriction on uh my systems at the time the single vessel systems because we're talking 22 24 pounds of grain good lord um and it's just, it get, yeah, it gets up there. So it's about 59% pale, um, 11% flaked oats, uh, 7% chocolate malt, 7% Munich 2, like a dark Munich, 
five percent flaked rye, which I really like. Uh, it's actually it's like a very nice viscosity in the mouthfeel. Yeah. I think. Um, and then four percent roasted barley, two percent crystal malt, uh, medium crystal, and then five percent table sugar, which normally that table sugar would have just been pale malt. One um, of the one of the things I appreciate about this recipe is that it it kind of reminds me of the recipes you see from people who've been brewing for a couple of weeks and they want to try their hand at designing one. Oh yeah. You know, and we and the common recommendation is hey, back up off of some of those malts. You know, go a little bit simple but this is obviously one that you've spent time developing and it has that kind of artistic flair to me with these uh, all this varying malts <laughs> it does look like that though doesn't it Where it's like it's almost a kitchen sink beer in yeah, some ways yeah. anyways so again like thinking about some of the restrictions and uh, i was talking with brian at the time and thinking about like you know some of the, the other methods that might be interesting so for this one i ended up doing a uh, a reiterated mash so a reiterated mash is especially good if you have some space limitations right. uh, in your brewery. Uh, it's it's basically where you mash twice. You take half of your grains, um, and I mashed. I did like I mashed half these grains at 154. Uh, degrees Fahrenheit or 68 C for 60 minutes, then remove the grains, which if you're like brewing a bag, like I was, uh, that is a really simple way to do it. Uh, remove the grain, remove the grains, then add the other half of the grains to that same wort and let it sit for an additional 60 minutes of mash time. Um, so then, and that like that, so that's what a reiterated mash is. It's where you mash once with water and half the grains, the next half the grains, uh, you mash with that same wort that's been, uh, that the wort that you extracted previously. Now that's a good method for brewing big beers like this. Like you said, volume limitations yeah. in your kettle or your Huge. mash ton. Yeah. But it's, it's, it, it's, it's one way. I mean, you're still going to get that enzymatic conversion. And so it makes yeah. sense that if you add more grains to this already, arguably very strong wort that was in there, it's just going to get stronger. Yeah, exactly. And like it is, it also is interesting. Something that might be a cool experiment sometime on one, a reiterated mash would be cool. Yeah. But two, the, uh, when I talk about half the grains, uh, most people I know who have been practicing reiterated mashing for a bit actually save all of the chocolate malt, like all of the roasted grains until, and even some of the special, like some people I know reserve all the specialty malt until the second mash. Um, so that they don't like over extract or like over uh, imp aren't over impacted by like the dark extraction. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'd be a cool experiment sometime. And it's just something I know people who have been toying with. Yeah. But um, anyways, uh, then I combined the two warts that I had from that reiterated mash just to make sure that the, uh, the mashes that they were identical. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, as I went into hopping and stuff that there wasn't potentially hop impact by different gravities or something like that. Um, then 60 minute boil, uh, which is 60 grams of magnum at 60, 67 grams EKG at 30, uh, chill both of those, take a refract out. I chilled both. Uh, I put those warts again. I made, I homogenize them, keep put half in one keg, uh, half in, or you know, my fermenting kegs, half in one keg, half the other, and then half in the other and half the other. So just making sure it's consistent. Uh, and for both of them, that refractometer reading, I came out a little higher than my target gravity, which is like 1.123. My God. Uh, <laughs> that, which I mean, is pretty, pretty high. <laughs> that's huge. The, you know, hearing you talk about an 1123 OG wort stresses me out. I can only imagine what those <laughs> yeast right, felt the like. Yeast. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, because I gotta live in it. The uh, yeah, so those go into the kegs, uh, and then I hit both of those warts with sixty seconds of oxygen. Um, now that, as Marshall, I know you've mentioned like the YE study and the White Lab study. Um, on average, like talking about the dissolving pure oxygen, where like you're not you're doing this lightly, like you're not just like ripping your oxygen so that you know, it's bubbling like crazy and it looks like the, then you're just losing oxygen. Um, really this is slow. And then that 60 seconds on average should put you in the space of like 12 PPM. Right. And, and just to lay it out there, th this, the variable that we were looking at was the impact of double dosing of, of yes. hitting that beer once it was fermenting with oxygen again. So that's the reason both of these worts were dosed with your normal amount of oxygen. There was, this was yep. not an oxygenation experiment though. We've done those as well. Uh, this was, or oxygenation versus nothing. This was a double dosing. We wanted to see if that double dose, if that second dose had had any actual impact. I just want to get that out there because I think... Uh, in no, the, spot on. It's a good call out. Yeah, well, and when we published this one, people were asking, but you oxygenated both of them. Well, yeah, that was the idea. So, so yeah, just to clear, clear that <laughs> up. Definitely. Yeah. So 
both of these got pitched with uh, Imperial Yeast's AO7, which is flagship. Um, just a great all-around yeast. To gener- and it's also one I'm familiar with, so like I kind of knew how it was going to perform. And you'd made starters of these ahead of time, so they were getting proper oh, yeah, cell counts definitely. and all that stuff. Yeah, they were big. They were big starters. These these had, uh, which is another dimension of this. I think is interesting because I know some people who talk about, you know, is oxygen necessary, especially for low OG beers, if you're adding a big starter. Right. To it. Right. Um, and you know, that's, I think it's an interesting proposition. Like in theory, it'd still be required, but yeah, it's it's an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so did that. Fermented these at 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 19 C, and then 18 hours later. So after I'd started to hear a little bubbling, start like we were confident that it's consumed that oxygen um i gently took off one of the lids of the kegs gave it that second dose of 60 seconds of oxygen again like looking to contribute another 12 ppm um and then closed it up and left these beers for another just two weeks before taking hydrometer measurements and predictably um though i was a bit surprised by it the single dose ended at an F a final gravity of 1.021. Which just to say, that is a respectable attenuation for an 1123 beer. It is. It's. I actually anticipated that. Yeah, I anticipated that final gravity. I would have been perfectly happy if that was the final gravity. Right, right. Beer. Probably what you'd expect based on you brewing these beers before. 1021, yeah. that's pretty solid. The double dose batch, where'd that one end up? <laughs> that ended up at 1017. So, uh, quite, like, you know, it's, it's quite a bit lower. Um, and honestly, like every now and then I'll have, we'll have an experiment, like maybe the FG is like 0.01 different or something like that. Right. Um, but looking at this, like maybe it could be something else that I'm open to it. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that this is what we were testing and then saw that much of a difference, I'm, I would wager money that it ended up being that kind of an impact. Absolutely. And I feel like uh, there's, you know, we at Brewlosophy, we focus on sensory analysis. That's what we, so yes, it's, yeah, we totally. don't get to see objective results very often. You know, we're, we're seeing subjective results that we've compiled and put together. Totally. This, this speaks volumes to me that that no pun intended there but that by dosing <laughs> beer with oxygen while it's fermenting you you are seeing exactly what should be happening um and, it, and yeah. it, it, knowing the way that you brew and how controlled you are in your process this is very clearly to me because of that second dose of oxygen and i'll, and I'll be honest you see that if i'm seeing 10 21 10 to, to, to 10 17 difference there i'm expecting these beers to taste different as well i mean that's a four point fg difference in any other scenario maybe not a big deal but the fact that that you know again that this is exactly yeah. what you'd expect based on the variable i'm expecting to see a difference here so well after being uh pressure transferred into the serving kegs and you know get them carbonated they conditioned for several weeks uh before we got them in front of people and at the end of this i ended up having to do seven triangle tests uh to me these beers were just totally identical uh, which is not what I expected after seeing the, no. the final gravity readings, like you just mentioned, Marshall, which is, you know, both of these were very clean. Uh, they had that prominent, like bitter chocolate and roasted coffee note, um, a little bit of a soy sauce thing in both that I didn't love, but it actually, it is a little reminiscent of 10 fitty. Like if you ever had that yeah. so, a little yeah. warm, it really gets that soy sauce if it's not cold. Um, and then uh, not a lot of like almost no alcohol warmth, like despite being a 14% beer like a 14 and a half percent avb beer that's that's um, wild i'd expect it to be pretty warm i know <laughs> i know and it's uh <laughs> so we served this up to 22 people uh and out of that like in order to say that this was statistically significant then we would have had to have 12 people identify the odd beer out and we actually ended up getting nine so this was not significant people were unable to reliably tell these apart so you got two out of seven correct on the triangle tests. Uh, at, this was obviously pre-COVID. Nine out of 22 people uh, were able to identify the unique sample. It, th- this is so interesting to me because obviously you want the best you know environment for your yeast to be in. It it seems that double dosing with oxygen again really did have a positive. If if attenuation is something that if you, you yeah if you attribute that as positive, which I do personally, so do um, I, <laughs> so do I, yeah. <laughs> so so it's uh, so let's anytime, just call it positive. <laughs> yeah, let's call it positive. Anytime I can get an attenuation lower, I do it. Um, 
but yeah, the uh, yeah, it's exactly like it did have that impact, but it didn't seem to be at least in the context of this beer, like it didn't seem to be reliably noticeable. Yeah, it didn't have a perceptible impact. It did have an objectively measurable impact, and I think that that's fascinating. Uh, to me, you know, when, whenever we do these experiments, I always and it's one of the things I still love about uh, whenever we finish up an experiment and I'm reading through the article and I, I come up with some implications. What does this mean for me and my brewing? Yeah. Obviously, dosing the fermenting beer with oxygen after initially dosing the wort with oxygen uh, you know, beforehand seems to encourage increased attenuation compared to yep. just dosing the wort with oxygen once. But it didn't lead to a perceptible difference. So for me, in the very rare once every blue moon that I make a huge beer like this, I don't think... I, well, really, to be honest, based on what we've been doing with other oxygenation experiments, I, I'm still not going to go buy an oxygen tank. That's just not my thing. <laughs> but if you want to encourage that that increased attenuation and just make the absolute best environment for that yeast to be in, I, I see it as a, a pretty valid option. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I don't know. I've waffled back and forth on this. Uh, a couple times, but where I'm standing right now is I, I've brewed a couple big beers, uh, since this one and I, I used double oxygen each time. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm continuing to see like a little bit better terminal gravity. And I just really, like I just said, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to, ch- if I can chase a lower terminal gravity, like one that's not necessarily influenced by mashing thin or anything like that yeah. or mashing at a low P or mashing at a low temperature. Um, I'm going to chase it like process wise. And so, I did that double. I've been doing that double dose. I've been having good experiences with it. Um, So I'll probably continue to do it. And I think it's made, it's been somewhat consistent. Um, The only thing that's on my mind about it. One is I'm tired after a brew day (laughs) and I'm, I'm happy to like, in a way set it and forget it for a while. Like kind of opposite of like when I was a brand new brewer and I wanted to check on it and babysit it every day. Now I'm just like, I'm done with it and I want it to just sit and do its thing. Yeah. Uh, so that, that part of me is like, oh, I'm not going to do it, but I really do think that the terminal gravity is huge, that it makes that difference. And so I've been doing it and I, I really can't say if it would have tasted different, maybe not. <laughs> um, but I like seeing that lower final gravity. Yeah. And, and the two things that I think of uh, in, in I'll, I'll admit it contributes to me not wanting to do this uh, as well is one, every time you open your fermenter, yep. whatever the vessel you're fermenting in, you are introducing the risk of a contamination. I'm just not a big yeah, fan. Totally. Now, you know, Imperial Stout with its high alcohol, there's an argument to be made that it's probably not terribly risky. The other thing is I just hate I just hate cleaning things. And so that's fair. Too. You, I, you look at the pictures in your article and there are bubbles coming up out of your fermentation vessel as you're doing this that you had to clean up, you know. So so I don't, that, that's one of the things keeping me away from it. I mean, not only that, but like when you talk about the infection risk, uh, like I, I was like, this might go bad. And so I just had to dose everything in a bunch of sanitizer. Like, yeah, yeah. I was so nervous about something going wrong, <laughs> which I think that's like one piece of criticism that like, hey, could there have been an infection like when that happened? And I think the answer is like, maybe like, yeah, it could have. Um, anecdotally, I've continued to see those lower terminal gravities. And I am really careful about like trying to make sure everything's sanitized and yeah. all of, uh, and of that stuff. So I, I don't think so. And there was also no, again, like without a perceptible impact, there wasn't signs of an infection other than the lower gravity. Um, but I mean, I'm willing to say it could have happened. I just, I don't think it did. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt it did either. <laughs> so, well, we've got some reader comments to get to. The first one comes from Matthew Reichert, uh, who says, I have to wonder if the style brewed would be hiding any difference. Such a malt forward style with specialty grains dominating the flavor profile would seem to hide any difference that the yeast would impart. Yet at that OG, I'm not sure which style would let the yeast shine through. Uh, Matthew, that's exactly my thought is, is no matter yeah. how or no matter what style you're going with, uh, anything that's 1123 OG is going to be arguably very <laughs> characterful. So I'm not sure. I mean, if it's hiding it, then why are, you know, then, then, then there's no point in doing it anyways, I guess. I mean, that's fair. Like, yeah. So like if there, if, if like that lever regardless, isn't going to be able to be moved just because of the fact that the malt is pushing it back. Yeah. Um, I, I get that. That's a fair argument. The, you, I mean, it would be cool to do this sometime, like to do like an Imperial double Hellas box thing, <laughs> like just to uh, do like a crazy high OG Pilsner, uh, low hopping beer and like yeah. see if that makes an impact, which would be interesting. Like if we ever repeated this one, I think I would, actually make that same argument, Matt, and I would do the same thing of, okay, let's see what happens here in like a much less complex gravity and a much or a much less complex grain bill. Yeah. Um, not nearly as bitter. Uh, so it definitely, I think that probably might've played a role. Uh, but again, 
if you're going to be making a beer this big, uh, you're going to end up in some of these territories of like barley wines are going to be pretty strong. Like yeah. All that flavor is going to come through. So I don't know. I think it's a fair criticism, though. Absolutely. I, I, that, it's, it's always a fair criticism uh, that the styles hiding the difference. My, yeah. my, my, yeah. my retort to it typically is, but those are the styles people are brewing using fill in the blank method, you know? So right, if, right. if you're not tasting a difference in that, what, what are we looking for then? But that's, again, uh, like you said, maybe next time in, in, in testing this one again, we just do 100% 22 pounds Pilsner malt or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it'd be interesting. Uh, next comment comes from Will Barr, who said, I don't brew many big beers, but I imagine it's possible that the starter provided sufficient oxygen for the yeast. Some quick calculations show you could have easily pitched 488 billion cells using your stir plate. Yeah, I, I actually think that's a really good argument. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one, especially as our, you know, our yeast is getting more like more viable, like brewers are getting better and healthier yeast. And we are uh, getting, especially uh, with nutrients and like the way in which you know, like we're doing our wort now and like getting these starters. I, I really do think that um, we definitely are pitching more and better yeast. And part of that is like what oxygen is introduced into the, uh, the cells and like what, what reserves they are building up, so to speak, like the sterols and lipids during the actual construction of the starter. Exactly. Um, which is, which is totally a great argument. I would be cool to do this. Like it'd be expensive uh, for us to do like, just do it like from the pouch, uh, a couple big pitches and like just do really big. Like again, we are talking like 480 billion cells. Yeah. Um, now that said, like the air is going to give us eight PPM. Um, and so because of that, like you, again, like the yeast will build up those sterols and lipids. Uh, but this, we, this was such a big beer. This was so hostile. Like, I think if it was going to matter, this would have been the beer that it would matter in. Yeah, exactly. Um, with those practices. But right. I, again, this isn't, this is actually an argument for starters is that if it is extra insurance against like potential problems by not oxygenating or not aerating or not aerating enough or hostile environments for yeast, uh, that's a good argument for starters. Cause, and I, I still do it every time. I know you're uh, off on that sometimes Marshall, but you're also not brewing a lot of big beers. Exactly. Yeah. I've, I don't make starters very often at all anymore, um, be, but I'm usually using very, very fresh imperial yeast which comes with a ton of cells for the for my normal yeah. og beers so that's that's my i, I have nothing against starters uh, yeah. but i will say you know when, when people talk about starters think about starters it's usually uh the, their purpose is is commonly talked of being cell replication to increase yes. your pitch rate but more than that is happening in the starter uh these Absolutely. these these yeasts are developing those cell walls they're getting a bunch of oxygen or air sucked in if you're on a stir plate that's kind of the key and so the argument that by pitching a starter you reduce the need for uh, uh for oxygen in the wort makes sense to me uh, we'll just put it that way and leave it at that for now but it does make sense to me will uh next comment comes from another will this this one uh, will allwort says would open for fermentation until high croissant is achieved, for example, two to three days, depending on the yeast, accomplish the same things as directly aerating with O2. I've done some open fermentation, but never with a side-by-side -side tasting. Anyone have any knowledge to share? <laughs> I think that's a really good question. That's a really good, a really good point. Um, I don't know if it would be the exact same. I don't, yeah. don't want to say it would be the same. Um, I'm not ready to commit to that kind of a statement, but <laughs> I do think that like what we, I think what we've seen some of the open firm experiments actually speaks to it a bit where I do think that open firm like has some sort of an impact on the fact that it has more continuous, uh, access to access to that yeast, uh, access to that air. And then yeah. of course from diffusion, like that air is going to enter the wart as dissolved oxygen. Um, so I do think that it absolutely would contribute whether it'd be the same or not. I'm not sure, but I do think there would like, it, it would help. I don't know if, the uh, the way I think about open fermentation, it, one of the one of the arguments about why people can get away with doing it without contaminating their beer is that the croissant on the top uh, keeps contaminants out. I would imagine that it also blocks a decent amount of air uh, from getting to accessing that beer. So my bigger concern would be, well, when that croissant goes away, then what? You know, N now now you're now you're oxygenating fermented beer which you, you really don't want that's cold side oxidation right that's, so that's definitely one thing like practice wise you'd need to be sure of right like you'd have to like before fermentation is over make sure that you're sealing it back up exactly. like same thing you would with a standard open fermentation um and again like even even that krausen though being protective is only going to go so far like yeah. there's a reason like breweries who practice this do so in like really like specifically designed rooms yeah um yeah. 
because it's hard. It's tough. It's an interesting question, though. I mean, who knows? Maybe I mean, that is one of the arguments you hear about uh, commercial breweries who continue to open ferment is that access to oxygen. So possibly will. Uh, but but that is not something I have any experience with. All right. Final comment comes from Reddit user Cascades Brewer, who says, I gave double dosing a try for my last Russian Imperial Stout and had excellent fermentation. In my case, I have plenty of headroom, so no issues with making a mess. Based on my one data point, I plan to continue double dosing. And to me, this experiment affirms that it is a valuable practice. Well, there you have it, Matt. Yeah, I I like... uh I know Cascade's name actually. I do like uh, Cascade's is a really nice guy, um, and uh, so is Will Allward, who I know, who I've met a couple times. Yeah, uh, yeah. But anyways, the um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I actually, I anecdotally, right? Like I've said, like I, I've continued to do it as well. Um, definitely, you want headspace for it, um, as as I saw, which <laughs> the fermenting in kegs does not afford me that, uh, right. that headspace yeah, yeah. by any means. And I end up being. Uh, I'm like 4.5 or 4.6 gallons into the keg and that's not a ton of headroom. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's, I, I really think that it is, it's at least making a difference in attenuation. And I think it's making a difference in like speed to ferment, like speed of completing fermentation. Yeah. Um, I definitely think it's helpful. So I'm, I'm continuing to do it as well, but I would be interested in anecdotes. Well, you got one from Cascades Brewer. <laughs> sounds That's like, right. Sounds like they're going to keep doing it as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's an easy enough thing to do for people who, one, have an oxygen set up already and who like to make big beers that you might as totally. well. And if, if I'm that person, you know, then I'm, I'm definitely doing this for bigger beers. It, this isn't enough to convince me to go out and buy an oxygen tank. I've already said that. So, well, I think that about covers it for double dosing high OG styles with oxygen. Just a reminder that the newest podcast on the Brewlosophy Network, The Brew Lab, will be hitting the waves soon. We've dropped an introduction episode that's currently available pretty much anywhere podcasts are served up. Please go subscribe now so you're notified when we start releasing regular episodes. And if you're as excited about this show as we are, help us spread the word. We'd really appreciate it. All right, don't forget that you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no.